four minutes. No, nobody moved a limb. We just, we were awestruck. And we heard these guys for the first time. A cappella, no CD, no, just. So, <laughs> so I pulled them in and I did the first plantation boy story. There and there, we, we, we said we we're done with production. No, there had to be space for this. So we wrote the first plantation boy story. I think that, you know, um, everybody has, you know, their own different journey, you know, and um, sometimes, you know, the stars align and your purpose finds you. You know, sometimes when we start doing stuff, we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, but I think that when you're honest with yourself and you're true, um, you could be lucky enough for purpose to find you, you know. Um, I, I didn't particularly want to be a professional, you know, musician. In fact, where I fell in love with music, you know, hip-hop music, was when I was in a boarding school in Atlantico. And it's so funny, we used to sneak out after our lights out. So we form like we're going to study downstairs. I will put on the TV and we'll be watching AIT jams. So I will tell my juniors, because the way the boarding house was structured, we'll have like two checkpoints. So get like this uh, JS1, JS2 boys, they'll be standing there. So that if uh, Mr. Osaya Mitron is coming, <laughs> the first one will signal that one, and then the signal, they will put off the TV and do as if we're reading. Wow. So we used to watch AIT jams, and we hadn't seen these kind of videos ever. And it just put us in, an, in a different reality that, wow, like, you know, there's a world that actually exists beyond these body house walls. <laughs> 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 you know, and, you know, I was into my little poetry thing, and, you know, and that was the time, I forgot what video Nas had, but a lot of hip hop. You know, a lot of, um, I remember uh, JD, Jay Z and uh, JD uh, with the Ferrari money and everything, yeah. That was one of the times, and you just like watching the TV like this. <laughs> you know, so we used to start writing uh, raps, but we didn't have American accents, so we couldn't write, ra rap the rap. So we just write the verse on paper. And that's how we used to battle. So I'll write my own, my friend would write his own toy. And we have somebody who dictates who's on is better. So well, we can't rap it too, but we'll just write it. Just say, read my own rap, read my own rap. We'll be fighting with people. Read my rap, read my rap, read my rap, read my rap. And then my friend Maru will read it. He'll be like, no, 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 this, this one is better. Nito's rap is better. I say, yeah, I told you. Did it. So that's how, you know, it kind of started. Um, and then eventually, you know, I just got the courage to put, you know, to actually recite my raps, you know. So it wasn't like um, you felt like it was a great example or anything like that? No, not at all. You know, I just, it was just something that I liked, you know, uh, and I was really into poetry, you know, so this was a new experience for me. So I was just doing my thing. Um, I, went to, uh, I went to New York where I uh, got into uni first. I met um, Uzi Kwendu, um, who introduced me to Ikechuku. They were seasoned veterans and they just used to rap and, you know, like, rap. And you get to go move his shirt and he's all rapping and spazzing out. I'm not like, what? I'm like, I haven't seen him before. It would be freestyling, you know, sci fi, you know, just, and I was just like, wow, you know, you know. And then, you know, he teach me, okay, this is how you count, this is how you structure your rap. You count bars, this is bars, and this. And I was just so attentive to it. Then I became, the person who will curate the beats so that when it's time for us to rap, I'm the person who has the beats. Yeah. Ikechuku used to make some beats, but I used to go to this place uh, in Jamaica Avenue in Queens where they used to sell these mixtapes where they would just have beats, all the new beats of all the dope songs. I would really pack in the beats. I would go, we are the beats man, you know, and we'll be rapping two hours, three hours, sci-fi, it was intense. You know, um, and then we started, you know, experimenting, going to the studio. But I didn't take it as serious as them because, um, I mean, my thing, I was just going to go to school. Um, I was a privileged kid, we just go to school. I didn't have to worry about all that kind of, I didn't have to worry too much about my future. I was, st I was still quite young, so I didn't, you know, put too much thinking into it. But anyway, um, eventually, we did a couple of songs. And um, so uh, I was uh, a med student. But I didn't, that didn't go so well. <laughs> I, was, um, I was studying pre-med. And before we started the show, I was telling them, 
I have stories for days, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, we did, <laughs> I did the exam. <laughs> so it's called the MCAT. And MCAT, you have to, I think the, the highest score is like 30. So you want to get like 21, 22, 23, 24. That if you want nice, sexy universities like Columbia, NYU, <laughs> John Hopkins, you know those kind of schools that your mother would just be so proud, you know, that you call me, you're in the city. I got 14. <laughs> and they told me that the only place I go to school with this uh, result is all them Caribbean, <laughs> all the Fiji, uh, Granada. Those people, they just give you the book. I just tell you that, you know what, just teach yourself, <laughs> then you do exam. So I was just like, man, what am I going to do with this my life? <laughs> I still had you, I had some songs and what have you. I said, okay, I'll do public health. And then somebody told me that public health is for people who want to be poor, even though that's a bad, <laughs> <laughs> even though that's a very bad generalization. <laughs> because I mean, we need those kind of people who are selfless in society. But anyway, so one thing led to another. I sent some of my music. We did a mixtape, uh, myself, Ikechuku, Uzi, and some other guy called Eugene. We did a mixtape. You know, I wish I had the cover. I don't ever want to see the cover of the mixtape. <laughs> you know, so we did a mixtape, and, you know, we gave it to my, my cousin who lived in Abba, a woman here. So he went to the radio station, and he was telling them to play this one. Nobody had ever heard, you know, people saying that they were Igbo and rapping with that kind of precision, with that New York swag. And all. It was just like an anomaly, like, what's going on here? This is not like the rap that, you know, rapping in Nigeria. So it's something different and a little bit interesting, I guess. So, um, Obi Asika, my older cousin, hears it driving on the road, random station. He's just like, what's going on? Nito, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and he's like, I was just like, look, I don't know this music thing. No, I mean, you know, I'm just speak to Ikechuku and what have you. And, um, but my parents weren't having it at all. My mother wasn't having it. She used to send me threats all the time. She used to be threatening me. He said, I'm going to kidnap you. <laughs> I will take off your legs. I'll tell him to shoot you. <laughs> she just was not having it. So she came to visit me. And this was when she, this is the time she was the Minister of Aviation, I think, or Transport. She came to visit me. And somebody had told her, you know, I just snitches all over the place. So somebody had snitched on me that, uh, Uzi is always coming, I will always do freestyle and, you know, and we'll be drinking Bacardi 151 and all that kind of stuff, you know. And she was just like, I've told you about this thing, I don't want to hear it. And, you know, because she didn't have a good representation of, like, what artists were in Nigeria. We hadn't reached that stage, you know. And, I mean, all, all respect goes to people who came before us, but there was a time whereby, you know, um, you know, Nigerian artists kind of put themselves in a position to be judged, you know, um, and unfairly, I guess, you know. But anyway, so my mom was like, you know, you know, like I should tell her that one, she, well, she didn't, she was unfamiliar with rap music as well. You know, we come from where it's bongo music, mm -hmm. you know, Sarowiwa and uh, Ogirigi. Uh, uh, so, and maybe their own pop music, Michael Jackson, she knows that one, but rap. So she like, she tell her, five people, that's five rappers that are successful. I said, ah, that's easy now. I said Jay-Z, um, I said uh, Will Smith. I said, by the time I reached the fourth person, because she saw I was talking about it with so much conviction, I said that, obviously, I'm not as good as them. I said, ah, <laughs> I was like, ah, ah. I was like, mommy, that's a low blue now. <laughs> so we started laughing. I was like, you didn't have to say that. I started laughing and then, you know. But she was still upset. But um, to speed, speed it up, so we have linked up with Obi. Uh, we did um, Big Brother Niger, um, and we were performing at the vault. So my first performance, um, you know, um, Ikechuku is somebody that always wanted to be a musician. We, well, I, well, yeah, pretty much always wanted to do it. So it's natural for him. He likes the spotlight. He likes all that. Rah! You know what I mean? Like me, I was like, oh, I'm a little bit shy. You know, so they were like, okay, Nitya, you're going to perform to this coming Friday. I'm like, hey, me, perform? Ha, it's too late to back out of this thing now. I had two songs. I had Homie Lover. I had Sitting on Top. Um, so the day, um, there was one VIP area in the vault. We go upstairs at the back. I just went to the toilet there. Before I was performing, I just knelt and I said, God, please. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I offended you. <laughs> 
just sing me today that I don't have cardiac arrest <laughs> on stage, but I don't know I'm going to face these people. I've always, I grew up very shy uh, and I'm very introverted. So I remember I wore my uh, long Jeezy, my young Jeezy uh, snowman t-shirt with my baggy shorts and my sneakers and my big shades I'm covering my whole eye. So I came down um, I'd been trying, you know, trying to recite my raps. You know, I performed maybe one, not as serious as this. This is the vault. This is like, I don't know where these people came from. It was intense. So I just got on the stage, said me to see, I just, everything I had, all, I just forced, I just, cause I, I was too shy. I just, everything, I just used to get on stage and comport myself and the ovation was, too much. I couldn't even hear the song. And then somebody threw a condom at me. <laughs> but no, obviously, it won the packet. <laughs> and I was like, hold up. And I said, you should stop the music. I said, you know, I didn't really expect this, but you got, like, I'm really, like, encouraging. I was like, you know, it was a rush of, rush of blood for me. It was a wonderful experience. Like, people just liked me just because of how I looked, you know? And it started giving me ideas about understanding you know, the job of actually being a musician. But anyway, I just continued um, pushing on. Because at this point in time, I didn't want to fail. But I also knew that the music I had put out wasn't um, strong enough to hold um, as many people as I needed to hold. You know, so that's when I eventually started working on my first biggest song, which was Kidding Big Deal. No, it was after that. Was after that? Yeah. But you, you, you should know my feet was, was really big as well. No, actually at the time, not really. Because, really? Um, I mean, it was, was new. Don Jazzy was there. The band was there. It was good old days. Um, we shot in Kelechi at Mario B studio. Um, I was wearing a Piaget watch. And, you know, the peace slang, that's where it started from. And you see, the thing about great songs is that um, there's something that just lives on you know, and continues to give relevance to the song. And then people listen to the song more and appreciate the song more. And then the song now develops a life of its own. Um, so maybe, I guess that's why I seen at that time, at that time it was kind of slow, but I knew that I needed more than the posh kids and the people who lived on the island. Like I needed... I, I mean, especially for someone that was not a season, I mean, you were just coming in. Yeah. Then how were you able to identify that this is not, this is, this is not longevity, I need to break up from this, well, because I was, I, was honest, I was honest with myself, you know, um, I always knew where my strengths lie. It was never that I was the fastest rapper or I had the biggest punchlines. It was that I was the guy who used to pick good beats and who could do choruses. That was, that's always been my thing. You understand? So I've always been honest with myself. So I knew that. I look good. Eh? Well, I, I know I'm half cast, but you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to be shouting it up and down. <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, so I knew where my strengths lie, and I was honest with myself, and I knew that, you know, look, first of all, I can't be a failure because I've already taken, at the same time, I'm skipping a lot of stuff. I was trying to, my education, all that kind of stuff, what am I going to do with that? And, you know, so anyway, um, we had done about 70 or 80 something songs when I joined up with Storm. Um, I started doing a lot more production, so um, artists would come to Abuja, and then I would work with TY Mix, or there was another guy, VC Perez, so we'll sit down, we'll curate the music for them, I'll help them, you know, structure the song and what have you. So we did a lot, um, we worked with uh, Two-Face, we worked with um, Dari, when Dari had Two-Face on the song, we worked with GT Guitar Man, we worked with Sasha, Ikechuku, Alaye, uh, GT the Guitar Man, so a couple, so I was doing a lot of production. And that's what kind of helped me because I was more familiar with production. So I'd done like over, I had done like 30 something songs and I'd done like maybe like 70 something songs in general. And you know, like sometimes you make 20 songs all rubbish is the 21st one that makes sense. But you know, that, that repeti rep repetition um, gave me an added advantage to be able to curate something music that I felt that I, you know, would most likely work. So, you know, the day we tried to uh, create the song, um, T.Y. wasn't getting it. I was just frustrated. We went somewhere for um, Dari's wife's birthday or something and in Abuja. And then he was just so upset. He was like, let's go back to the studio, man. And then before you know it, which is why another thing, that when it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. Like in 30 minutes, boom, we've done the beats. 
I took the beat home, put it together. I played it for the band and um, so Don Jazzy and Nikki Chuku. So I know that it was like a, a slang at that point in time, but how did you know like to throw, to throw Kitty Big Deal? Because I had tried to create another slang before that. I was working with Ale and I was playing with, I was playing with, I was playing with some Yoruba and I was trying to coin something, but it didn't work with him. But for me, it worked. Because <laughs> what I didn't get with him, I just kept on thinking about it and I came up with the Kini Big Deal. And then I was in Abuja, so I just, um, well, obviously, Walai, lighter, like me, lighter. I was just thought, you know, <laughs> You know, a, a book is, you know, usually sell light. I come buy or say, from the, all that kind of stuff, you know, so. But yeah, it's a weird process. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think through that, the journey didn't stop there, obviously. You know, I, I decided I wanted to go do my master's. Yeah. If I may yeah. interrupt. There's a question I always wanted to ask you at TY, but I never got the opportunity. Yeah. Kinny Big Deal. Awesome song, yeah. Crazy hook, everything. But for me, the clincher was a chord. There's a chord progression somewhere. Ba, 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 Every time I listen to that stuff, I hear curious. I hear curious. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. But curious. Um, Midnight star. Yeah. Okay. Was that a deliberate? Uh, did somebody, you know, were, were you guys in that? What, did you guys listen? Was was there any at any time? Was there a sample? Was there did somebody like sample and yeah. inverted? You know, one yeah. of the. We didn't sample anything. Every what we, our, our creative process was, we go through a bunch of tones, mm -hmm. and then we say, I, "I like this sound. Keep this sound one side. I like this sound. Keep this sound one side. I like this sound. Keep this sound." And then based on what we have picked, okay, play something like this, play something like that. So we didn't actually copy it, but that's the thing about if you are, if you permit me to say, like great music, like if you listen to like somehow it 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 touches you, yeah, it has a nostalgic feeling, you know. Um, so I, like I was saying, so we play. Um, I tell um, I was well quite well quite close with um, um, more hits at that time, specifically Don Jazzy and the band, myself and Nikki. So I told them I didn't know how to tell them that I'm going to school. I'm going to do my master. <laughs> I didn't have to tell Storm that I, I'm going to, you know. But I told him, I'm like, look, um, this is what I decided to do. And they were like, are you crazy? Like, you're doing so well now. Why would you this go? Is yeah. Well, how was like the moment when Kini Big came out? I only remember like 10% because it was too fast. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. You know, all over, we started, I mean, that, we started traveling. Like in South, South Kini Big Deal blew in South Africa before Nigeria. The first time I performed Kini Big Deal in South Africa, they called me to come back the next day to perform it. And they thought my name was Cabello. <laughs> <laughs> they, thought, they thought I was South African. Like they that. thought I was South African, you know, so. I mean, not to cut you off, because I remember, I, I, think, I think I was in New York even when, when the Kini Big Deal came out. And I mean, Obi, you can come in here at any time or anybody, but I remember it, it was. Um, it was the it was the first. Kitty Big Deal was it was less the song, it was like a feeling, mm. and yeah. 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 it was a yeah. swag. Yeah. And yeah. the way yeah. like the, the way the, 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 the music was was almost yeah. like hype, like you know, it was like. Yeah. Hey. It was like and a personal like soundtrack, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And it came at a time where you can easily tell somebody what's the big deal. Yeah. 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 You know, the thing is that at that time the industry was in a different position altogether. Like, the, it was largely influenced by what was happening in South Africa and the imagery, you know, so Channel O, uh, Mnet, you know, those were very strategic relationships for us that, you know, helped us get more popular across, across the um, continent and then, you know, um, beyond. Social media hadn't really kicked in at that time, you know, so... Um, it's just a function of things really coming together and working with, like for example, like with, with, with like what he was saying about how he built the magazine, how, how they were working on the magazine together. You see, when you have a starting point, when you're working on a project and everybody just believes that this project, yeah, we have to come together and make this thing successful. You understand? And it's not even about the money, it's because everybody's living through this project. You understand? 
for they don't know where they are going to be next year, or but they just know. You understand? That was the that was that's what Storm Storm Records had at that time, which is why we were able to do so well within that period. But I mean, it's another thing to hold it together, you know. So you guys kind of ran for you won for a while. Look, to be honest, <laughs> they say um, there's nothing like a, a, a permanent champion. There's only a, what they call it. There's only temporary champion. You know, you can't be champion forever. You know, you do somebody else who come, you do somebody else who come. I you mean, know, you can ask Manchester United. <laughs> 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 That's a different case. But I wanted to round up um, on what I was saying. So anyway, so I finished I finish school and I came back. And when I came back, like, you know, nobody was asking me for interviews anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hearing people say I was a war hit one there. And I took offense to it, <laughs> naturally. So, um, I'm trying to bring the story together. So I did my, I did 10 over 10, that's when 10 over 10 came. And then things, you know, picked up again. And then I decided I wanted to get married, which some people thought was a crazy idea. For me, I've always seen like a greater sense of, always had a greater sense of purpose. Like I'm the type of person who like, the awards I win, I don't keep, I don't even know where they are. They're probably with Obi Asika. I don't take those things, I'm, like I don't clinch to the fact that um, I'm famous or that, you know, I have had a big song. Like, I don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder. Like, I don't, those things, I don't care about those things because the same, um, same grace, you know, that I had to do all the, these great things, I mean, I don't, it's, it's beyond me. It's always been beyond me, you know. So I don't really dwell too much on those kind of things. And I don't think, I never felt like, oh, I just have to live my life as an A2C forever. That's a, that's a boring life. That's an unfulfilling life. You know, for me, I just wanted a greater sense of purpose. You know, at the time, I had met my wife, and I said, if I didn't marry this guy, another person is going to marry her. <laughs> <laughs> you what know. did you see about her that you said this is probably the one? Um, she, she, she was just like, you know, just a perfect fit, and just, you know, someone who could tolerate me, you know. Um, you need a lot of and, Well, <laughs> no, for, no, not just entertainment. I mean, us men, I mean, any married man will tell you that their wife is tolerating them to be honest, you know, and sometimes it's both ways, you know, tolerance is a big thing. But I just found like a, a, a perfect fit, you know, and I felt like I was at the point in time where, you know, I had a good start, you know, I already been, you know, blessed enough to have accomplished, you know, what I had, you know, so I felt like I was at a point in time where I could make that move. And then, but my career has always been like that, like when I decided to go to school, and like people are like, yeah, you know, what he, well, he's done. And then you come back again, and then wow, and then you get married. And you know, so it's never really been, my life has never really been oh, yeah, based around the music. You know, I just feel like there's something, I have a burning sense of something greater, you know, than just focusing on that. But to be honest, yeah, when you get married, things get real. That's just the truth. And there are some things that are more important than that. And Part of what I had done is that I knew that I wouldn't be able to be a rapper forever. So I started planning for my transition early, before I got married. Because the thing about it is that currently, I may not have moved, I'm, I haven't put out that much music, say, for the last two years. But at the same time, there's so much personally, personal life that I have to, that take a lot of my attention. You know, I have two kids, you know, um, it's my son and my daughter, they had delayed speech, you know, and that took a lot of attention from me because obviously I'm worried. They're doing perfect now, you know, but that took a lot of time and a lot of concentration and a lot of sacrifice too. So there are some things that are more important about the song I sang or the song I'm going to sing. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I started a business a while ago um, because I knew that I'm not going to be rapping forever. And to maintain the kind of lifestyle I want to maintain for myself and my family, I need to be forward thinking. That took some time to take care of, you know. So family building is, is more, it's quite serious, it's serious business, you know. So yeah, so those are like some personal things, you know, that kept me a little bit distant, you know. But for me, look, if it works, it works. You know. do, you still, do you still love music? Do you still want to be in it? 
Oh, well, of course, I'm still. Yeah, of, of course, I'm still. I'm still shooting a video in the next few days. <laughs> you know what I mean. And my approach is that look, man, if it works, it works. Because at the end of the day, I'm an honest person. I'm true. If the music is dope, the music is dope. That's it. If the music isn't, if the music doesn't work, the music doesn't work, and it's not going to stop me from shooting another video or what have you. But I'm a realist, you know. So. When was the time your mom said, "You know what? Maybe this rapping thing ain't so bad." Um, the um, Atlantico. They uh, they did some events where they were recognizing past students, and did you come for it? I spoke at one, but I don't think that's. The okay, one. but there was one. They shall give us one big <laughs> award or what have you, and you know, my uh, relationship with my mom is very. I mean, like like most uh, mommy's babies or what have you. My mom, eh, how I got through secondary school was that at a time when things were really rough, to, for every semester she had to sell some jewelry so I could attend the school. And uh, sometimes we would, we used to live in Oware. My auntie would live in Lagos, I stay in Lagos. So sometimes we wouldn't be able to afford to fly plane. So we used night bus, you understand? And we had done that for years. So for her to get me through Atlantic Hall, you know, there was so much sacrifice, you know, so to, for me to have been, you know, recognized, you know, was very touchy for her. You know, sometimes maybe they won't be able, she won't be able to pay my school fees and she'll call Miss Phillips and tell Miss Phillips that, you know, there's need some time and Miss Phillips, okay. So Miss Phillips equally, who was the principal of our time, you know, was really proud because they're like, this guy is popular, you know, was doing his thing, you know, I don't know, I think I had Kennedy, yeah, I had Kennedy at that time. You know, so um, my mom was very touched, you know, that, you know, all the sacrifice she was making, you know, it's turning out to be something, you know. Um, so, yeah, we did that. And then the following day, we did um, uh, This Day Style, the cover. I think we did the first uh, mother and son mm -hmm. cover. And I flew her <coughs> in and we did it. And mind you, when I was going to uh, do my master's, I didn't tell her, I just told her I'd gotten admission and I'm going. She's like, but how are you going? I said, I've already paid my school fees. She's like, how? I said, I like, my own money. And your I music, bought myself. With your music money. Yeah. yeah. Your rap music money. My rap <laughs> money. Yeah. Just get it right. So I told her, I've already paid. I bought a car. I'm going to be driving in Scotland. I pay my school fees. So the accumulation of all these things, now it, now be, it was now beyond me being, being a musician. It's now about me, my person. You know, and yeah, like the video I'm shooting this weekend, my mom called me, said, Nito, you know him. I don't, let me not say it evil so you guys will understand. She told me that, look, first of all, I need to find a dance there for this video. <laughs> I need to find a nice dance. And uh, then that suit, there's one suit that you wear, I really like. I think that maybe you should wear the same suit for this video. I'm like, mom, cool down. Like, cool down. Like, you're doing it too much. Cool down. So now she's so invested in, you know, my success. But this is all because of the journey. Mm that we've traveled and, you know, so, like, people will look at it from the surface. In fact, I tell, like, when people, young musicians, they come, but I'm like, look, if I bring out my CV for you now, I actually do have a CV. I've had, like, about 12, 13 jobs in my life. What kind of jobs? My first job was in CVS pharmacy. I was a pharmacy technician. My last job that I, well, I work for myself now. So. <laughs> but I've, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked in uh, oil and gas, I've worked in, um, there was a time I took a break, I was, I, I was uh, working in a friend's company, a financial advisory firm. So we had this project we were raising $65 million for, that went through. That's a, diff that's a funny story, maybe I'll give you guys that story another time. But I've had jobs, you know, um, even, and my, myself, as need to say, has never really, you know, come in between living life like a regular person. Which is important to you, because you seem like, like a very practical person. No, it's extremely important because you become a slave to yourself mm -hmm. as an artist. You see some artists, they can't go to shop rights. How are you a human being and you can't go to shop rights? I don't understand. <laughs> like, why don't you have the freedom? You want to go to Mega Park? Why, why can't you do that? You Let's take from the in here again. Uh, yeah. I think it's worse than where you can go and where you cannot go. Uh, from experience, one of the most difficult things you, you encounter dealing with, with talent is um, the, the definition of reality. Mm -hmm. 
in, in, in my circle, we, we, we use the word artist. We, we use the word artist as, a, as a, um, another, you know, another word for someone who's like really disconnected from reality. Right, so if you if if you're in my circle with my, my crew and you say something that is like you sound really deluded or something, we we we'll walk or say, man, feel this guy an artist, right? That's the expression, that's the <laughs> word we use because the, you 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 get to a point where you you're wondering why is it that it is only this guy of the one two three four five six people sitting in this table plus yourself, why is it that it's only this guy that cannot see, does not realize that this thing is maroon. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a conversation with him, you, you see denial, you see, you see delusion, all kinds of stuff. Talent is very difficult for, for people to fit. So you put out a bad record. It's a bad record. It's not, I mean, it's a bad record. You can't tell the guy that he's put out a bad record. You can't tell him you, something is going wrong with your career. 96% of that stuff is rooted in your choices, in, in what you do and how you do it. But you, you can't sell it. So it, it goes to a point where they, and I, it probably has a link with this manager type scenario where you're dealing with someone who has to, who has to align with you, who has to tell you what you want to hear. You arrive for a concert late, for an appointment late. You, are, you have a management team who would, you want them to tell you that they, you know, it's not your fault that they didn't start on time. You don't want to deal with a guy who tells you you cannot be late. And is that not the danger of, of what we're talking about, where you have yes men around you versus someone that is being real? People deliberately select Sometimes the criteria to being an artist or a celebrity's yeah. inner circle is your level of yes-manism, mm. right? You have to have this like really, really outstanding level of yes-manism for you to for, for them to feel comfortable enough to uh, to to, to, to be as to put you in their space. Yeah. So for for what? Artists are eccentric. It was worse. It's not being eccentric. See, you you listen to a guy who's at the at the peak of the buzz of Kenny Big Deal. He's saying. It has to be a lot more to my life than mm. Kinney Big Deal. So I, I, I want to go get my master's degree, right? That idea, people, re people reacted to you the way they did because they cannot come to, they, they, they cannot process it. Yeah. And they cannot do it. They yeah, cannot process it. They, they must so think that you're, you're one of two things, stupid or crazy, right? So for you to be able to say I'm NATO C, um, it, an artist, a celebrity. I'm also a human being. There's life, there's family, beyond music. Yes, music might be important this week, but however, I have a kid, I have a wife. They, the, that whole thing. So they're not just, they're not just, it's not about where they can go. It's some kind of psychological siege. Yeah. They're reading the stuff, they're social media, you're looking for you know, you can't, what you wear, were, were you photographed with this shirt last week? Do you want to be seen photographed with this shirt again this week? The pressure, the, the, the likes, the, it's, so, it's so consuming that half those guys are living in self-created jail cells here. So it's not about where you can go. Yeah. Life is fake. They, they don't well, understand. Life is too fake, and you know, just living up to unrealistic um, standards just because you yeah. want to be accepted or you want to be liked, it also creates you know a certain level of self hate because you're never enough. Mm. You always constantly need to upgrade you, and after some time, you just get tired of it. You know, so I mean, I've, I I saw that early in my career, and I was just like, I'm not going to be anybody's slave. <laughs> Because the truth of the matter, I love my fans, but at the end of the day, I have to look out for me and mine. <laughs> first and foremost, you know. First and foremost, you know. A friend of mine hooked me up with a job. They waited to interview me till 9.30 p.m. I was that highly recommended. Mm. The guy told them if you wanted someone to fill this position, get this guy. They called me. I was in a studio making music. And they called me and said, you know, can you just, like, 
And I said, see, I would come, but I have to be done with this session. I didn't even have an idea how big the company was. So I wrapped up the session. Funny enough, I don't even remember the song we're recording. Probably never put it out. But it meant everything to me within you know, that eight-hour session period. So I wrapped up at about past six. I got into a vehicle, and I went all the way to uh, Lagos Island to have this interview at about 9.30 that night. Uh, so they said, fine, but the chairman has to like, see me before I can resume. I'm sure some people here, they know. We didn't say the chairman needs to see you before you officially yeah. resume. They, so I, 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 I returned home. Um, and I was married then. And we probably, between the two of us, we probably had maybe 1,200 naira home and abroad. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my wife re referenced it three days ago. I told her that I can resume. Like, you what? I, I can't, I just, so I come this whole distance to just like go get a nine to five. So what, I mean, you mean I'm like gonna dress up, go to the bus stop and resume at for like a job, a, a J-O-B job, regular job, not like our hustle, you know, not hip hop world, not global sounds, not, you know, mega mob. I'm going to risk for a job. So I didn't go. Now, I found out like three, four days ago that she couldn't sleep for three days. Three days, three nights, she couldn't sleep. But she had to be supportive. Mm. So she just said, she told me three days ago, I told her something about the project we just embarked upon, and I got like the financial reports that we were good and all of that. And she said, do you remember when you refused to take, you know, resume at, at that job? I said, it's OK. The way I felt, that, like the first three days, I couldn't sleep. When you said you're going to do this stuff this year, that's exactly how I felt. And I didn't know what to say to you other than like keep going, but I just had like my fingers crossed and just hope that you knew what the hell you were doing. Um, it's funny how you mentioned Jimmy Jad. Jimmy Jad, I keep telling him today, it's funny when, <laughs> when we have gigs together, I'm like, I'm like, you can never understand this, but you're the reason why I'm DJing. I don't know if you remember way back, uh, um, Nigerian bureaus used to have these concerts, carnivals at TBS. And my dad was radio and TV. Like Kenny said, like, I literally grew up in the studio with these guys. Like, yeah. even this moment right now, there's a lot of nostalgia going on because Hip Hop World was my Bible. Like, in school, we're reading. Our notes, and we're reading hip hop while trying to figure out what this rapper was saying <laughs> and what this uh, R&B person was singing, you know. So it's just it's a lot going on at this table, but you know. So my dad was, you know, radio and TV. Nigerian Beers was sponsoring open house party, which was you know big back in the day. Right after your show, it came on. <laughs> so we go to TBS, and it's a lot of people. I'm just like, ah, what's going on here, you know? Well, all these people here. I forgot what artist was performing, but after that, the MC announces that, you know, and, you know, Jimmy Jad coming, everybody goes crazy, Jimmy Jad. <sighs> Jimmy Jad, who, who is this guy? You know, like, why is he, is he a pastor? <laughs> why, <laughs> why is everybody cheering for him like this, you know? And he comes on and he's playing, um, I don't know if you remember Black Girls, 90s Girl. It's a song. I'm the 90s Girl. So he gets to the part where it, it says, hold up, wait a minute. And when he says, hold up, wait a minute, Jimmy Jad did, do, do, ke, do, ke. dangerous. <laughs> Everywhere, even my dad was like, oh, <laughs> you know. And I was just like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. How did that magic happen? That's not, those are two different songs. What's going on, you know? And literally, that's when my curiosity started with DJing. Like, from that moment, I wanted to figure out what Jimmy Jad did. <laughs> I wanted to know how he made that, this dangerous sound perfectly with, Black girl, 90s girl. So that's how it started. Um, then, you know, in school, popular guy, social prefect, organizing all the parties. Being coming from, <laughs> coming from the entertainment life and family, I was always the guy, the go-to guy for, you know, the, uh, the parties. And that's why I became social prefect in school. So I remember having to deal with, you know, Shy Shy Shellon. I remember that name is still, <laughs> you know, DJ Shino. Fresh Waves, we used to go to Fresh Waves from, in our school uniform. 
I used to skip school, my dad never knew this. <laughs> I used to, at some point, like during prep or extra hours, one of my friends that came from London that lived in Yaba used to go to Fresh Waves to pass time to DJ. So we'd go with him, you know, to get some mixtapes and stuff like that. Come back as a cool kids, like, yeah, we know where Fresh Waves. So, you know, I, at some point in secondary school, we reached out to all these DJs for like school parties. But I was, I was really just intrigued about how they make this thing happen. They're like at a very young age, I understood that the DJ is the life of the party. And I wanted to like, I didn't necessarily at that point wanted, want to become a DJ, but I wanted to understand it. You know, fast forward to going to university and growing up in the media space, I was working retail at Express. <laughs> at Express in the Danic Mall. It wasn't cutting it, man. The check, the check wasn't coming through, you know, like I wanted it to. So I party, I, I played around with the idea of becoming a party promoter, but then the evil man in me kicked in. I was like, listen, I have to put this much money in and I might not get it back. Like, nah, yeah, that, was, that didn't sit well with me. So I'm looking for extra income at this point. And then there was a fun fair day in school one day. And this DJ, a white guy, his name, I still remember his name, DJ Holti. His name didn't even really make sense because I don't understand what Holti meant. But, <laughs> you know, DJ Holti has his CDs, you know, and a Newmark CD mix too. You know, he's playing, crossing over, mixing music. So I was like, yo, this guy, I had some free time between classes. I was like, this guy is probably going to have time to explain to me what this whole DJing thing is. And literally right there, and then <clears throat> I learned how to DJ Crash Course. After, cause I was that one student, I kept going to ask him too many questions. It's like, guy, yeah, I just came here to DJ for your school, but since you're interested, this is how you do it, you know? And he taught me on the spot how to DJ and promised me that if I'm serious with it, he will burn, I think it was like 500 CDs, that he would duplicate his whole library for me and give me the connect to buy my equipment to learn how to DJ. I went to class after that, but I couldn't concentrate because like the fire, <laughs> fire was burning. I was like, this DJ thing, how much do these 500 CDs cost? But, you know, I remember going back home to explain to my sister, Sarah, because we were living together at that point. I'm like, yo, I really, really want to do this thing. I need to get these CDs. I need to, we need to save up pocket money. We need to figure this thing out. And she helped me out. We saved up money. I remember going to DJ Holty's house. It was like an hour away from where I lived in the winter in Boston. So it wasn't a smooth drive. <laughs> You know, buying the CDs with my cousin Paul at the time. We drove out there, got the CDs, came back. I was excited. Okay, I have the CDs now. Boom. But I don't have the equipment. <sighs> I need to get this equipment. So as I'm pondering on this thing, I was dating this girl. It always comes down to a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I was dating this girl, and I still remember her. Her. She had. A, she had another guy, and I was so heartbroken. I was. I was a side nigga trying to become the main nigga. <laughs> so she had this other guy. I'm like, you know, this guy doesn't, he doesn't mean anything. You know, Ghanaian guy, what does he know? You know, this is where you need to be, kind of thing. You know, so I was obviously looking for an edge over this guy. And um, I figured this DJ thing would catch her attention. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy my decks. So I bought my decks and I started practicing, practicing, practicing. And her sister's birthday party was coming up 5th of December. I can't forget it. It's coming up the 5th of December. Practice, 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 practice. And I told her, I'm like, I'm a DJ. I'm going to play her sister's birthday party, but make sure this guy is not there. <laughs> make sure this guy is not there, you know. And she's like, are you sure you can do it? You just started this thing. And I was like, don't worry. I practice. I have it, you know. I bought my first um, speaker, American audio speaker. So how I set up, I put my decks on top of the speaker. <laughs> I DJ, like, I didn't have any table, any fancy, anything. And it was CDs back then, like right when the transition from vinyl to CDs was happening. So I started out with CDs. And literally, that's, that was my first gig. How was the gig? It was cool. The guy showed up. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up, messed up my gig, but then that was that was where I actually won her because then I was I became as much as I grew up around people like Keke and D one and my father that that could talk on the mic. I am not a talker, you know. So I always I found a way to relate or you know, to to pass my message across through music. So even I still do it to today. 
like if I want to talk to bears, I know what how to mix to pass a message across. Or even like with some of my cool friends, and we have certain songs that take us back to the certain moment. I know I can play this, and they look at me like, ah, I see what you're doing there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that day, I was R&B king, playing all these girls. I didn't even send her sisters back to get Playing all her sweet jazz, you know. She's looking at me, but then the guy is sitting there. She's looking at me for a second, like, okay, I see what you're doing there, you know. And that day, she broke up with the guy. <laughs> she broke up with the guy that day, and we started dating. But then before the end of that, uh, December, it didn't. It was rocky. It didn't go too well, you know. But another that's DJ, really another DJ took not, not really another DJ take over. But it was just you know this DJ thing you're doing. Is, you know, too many people like you. Too many babes are you know. So let's leave it alone. So, but I now decided that I wanted to do like I, this is what I wanted to do. Let me see how far it can go. So I started doing house parties for free, mm. you know. My friend having a party, okay, I'll do it. Maybe by the second gig, I blew my speaker because I didn't understand sound at that point. I didn't understand the EQ. I just needed it to be loud. <laughs> so I blew my first speaker. I didn't know how I was going to replace it. Luckily, I called Holti. He hooked me up, figured out where, um, told me where to, to get it sorted. But then coming from, like you said, coming from the media entertainment family, your parents really don't want you to go down that route because they understand the process they went through. And at first, my dad wasn't feeling it. He said, what? You're trying to be what? Born that, in his exact words, eh? born that equipment. Don't let me go to America and find it. And I went, I came to your house. <laughs> I, came, I, I was at his house. He got involved. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, I got to his house in Boston. <laughs> I just saw Dex. DJ Dex. I said, ah. Are you a DJ? <laughs> Why did you start doing this? I said, don't worry, don't worry. We we'll, we'll connect this together. And then we now went to a party. He was the DJ <laughs> at the big club. And everybody was dancing. I said, ah, yeah, it's your way back. Where you are a DJ. <laughs> Literally, to <laughs> ask who faced his first show, show in Boston, Boston was myself or my sister. I don't even know where we got the money from. I did. And my sister and I told me. And I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> my sister told me, listen, we have two faces hot right now because if we want to take it way back to, to like, when I say I grew up in the studio with these guys, like, the Remedies, Plantation Boys. Two faces. Langbaja was on the radio at some point. I remember Kenny and they were bringing me into the studio, I think, I don't know, maybe 10. And they're asking me, who, do you know this guy? Who's this guy? Who's this guy? I'm like, I don't know. And he, he does this. Yeah. He did well like this. And I was like, OK, I don't know. I did was like, he's like my child now. <laughs> do you know what's painting me about that moment? I don't remember his face. Because <laughs> I'm like, because I wanted, all I remember is that the, his name was Binga. Yeah. Or his Binga. Oh, oh, told me his name was Binga. Yeah. So I always had in my head that his name was Binga. But he was doing I, a salsa and jazz. That was yeah. before he started covering his uh, yes, using exactly. the mask. Yes. So that was literally like, <laughs> those are more, so when we now went to the States, we needed to leverage off of these connects that we had because we knew Kenny and D1, this is like literally, these are like older brothers, egg boys, you know, new to phase, the remedies. So it was kind of like, and then Dari, at one point, Dari even came to br help me brush up my skills with DJ when he was, yeah, <laughs> when he came to the States, like, okay, this is how you mix and this is how, he taught me how to loop. You know, this is how you loop and this is how you can because he was on the radio at that at yeah. that point. Yeah, you know. A DJ. Yeah. So it like my my and sometimes I try to especially when I'm talking with Asa sometimes I'm like, guy, yeah, you don't understand how far back it goes, you know. It didn't it, the process didn't start overnight. It was a passion that as a kid, you know, I we would literally record American Music Awards for my dad on Mnet. So where the kids are sitting by the VCR to say, okay, record. And when they're going on commercial break, stop. Oh, because yeah. he doesn't need that in the show. <laughs> you know, and then when the credits are going up, we're just happy to see our names as executive producer, Amy, Sarah, Michael, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, we, you know, we, I remember one time he blew our minds because he, he bought this tape of Tony Braxton and her album process from that, her first album on, um, on Break My Not on Break My Heart. Um, Tony Braxton. The first one. Self-titled. Self-titled. Yeah, self exactly. It was self-titled. Okay. He bought this tape, right? And it was an interview session. But my dad flipped it on the show and acted like he was asking the questions, like literally lied. 
it blew our mind because it was literally like he took the questions, asked them, <laughs> and then they would press play. Oh, he, was not really he wasn't there. So <laughs> we were just like, how did he make that <laughs> How did he make that happen? Even people that watch it like, wow, this guy interviewed Tony <laughs> Braxton. So I'm in church, sitting down, and my phone starts buzzing. Just like, ah, what's going on? Maybe is there an event? Did someone post a flyer that I'm, you know, that I'm DJing somewhere? I was like, there's nothing coming up. And then I look at the home screen and I see a tweet. And someone says, please, can someone check on DJ Obi? And I'm like, why is anyone checking on me? Mm -hmm. you know? And that's literally how I found out. Mm -hmm.